break. My, my name is Jackie Garrett um, and welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm the Fund Development Associate at Bridge Michigan, your source for nonprofit, nonpartisan news in Michigan. In this hour, we'll discuss Michigan's opioid crisis and how local governments are using the money received from opioid settlements. Today, our special guest panelists will include Amy Delinke, Technical Advisor of Opioid Settlement Funds at the Michigan Association of Counties, Dr. Kara Ann Poland, Associate Professor at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine, and Dr. Jonathan Stoltman, Director of the Opioid Policy Institute. Bridge Michigan's Robin Erb and Ron French will moderate the discussion today. You can read full bios of our panelists on the event page and we'll drop a link to that page in the chat. Our conversation will begin in just a moment and Robin and Ron will lead the discussion with um, Amy, Dr. Poland and Dr. Stoltman for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we'll turn to your questions. Please type any questions you have for our panelists into the chat window at any time. I'd like to really emphasize here, if you're not a panelist, please remain muted today throughout the discussion. Thank you. Um, we are recording today's conversation and it will be posted on Bridge Michigan this week. You can subscribe to our newsletters by visiting www.bridgemi.com and click subscribe. We would like to thank the Ethel and James Flynn Foundation, the Michigan Association of Health Plans, the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, and the Michigan Health Endowment Fund for their support of Bridge Michigan's health reporting. Events like this one are made possible by the support of Bridge members. If you'd like to join this membership community, we will drop a link to do so in the chat. A reminder, please stay muted throughout the conversation. I'll now pass it over to Robin to get us started. You're on mute, Robin. You're still on mute, Robin. Still on mute. Let me try that again. There you go. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I know better than to not have that ready. Um, before we start, first, thanks, everybody, for being here. We wanted to let you know, as, as Jackie said, we're going to be dropping in several links in the chat today. Those are going to be links to our stories, links to external websites where you'll find resources and more information about the settlement funds. The first link that Amber is now sharing is the link to our Bridge, Bridge webpage, and you're going to find all our stories there on Michigan's opioid and drug crisis. This includes maps and charts where you can see exactly where the funds are coming to your county or your area. Don't worry about it if you miss all the links in the chat. I'll include the links along with a link to this meeting in my newsletter tomorrow. So all that information is going to be in one place. Um, the Health Watch newsletter comes out just once a week with Michigan's most important health headlines, and you can sign up here. And again, all this today will be in that newsletter tomorrow. So sign up if you're interested. Um, let's let's first let's let's go at it from you know the most high level view. Dr. Poland, um, you not only sit on the Opioid Advisory Commission, you're a board certified addiction medicine doctor. Describe the impact of addiction specifically related to opioid addiction in Michigan right now or over the last few years. So the um, opioid epidemic has continued unabated here in the state of Michigan, like many other states. Uh, when we had the COVID lockdowns and the COVID shutdown, we saw an enormous increase in substance use across across our state. Um, one of the markers of substance use can be increased isolation, can worsen substance use disorders. Um, the 2023 preliminary uh, data from the CDC in terms of opioid overdose uh, predicts a about 2% increase in opioid overdose deaths this year. Um, not to be all doom and gloom, or from last year, pardon me, um, not to be all doom and gloom. There are a lot of programs and work being done uh, in our local communities to try to address this addiction um, crisis. And, and I think that's going to be the focus of what we're talking about. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how uh, we can continue to support Michigan communities. And so for, for, for readers or for viewers here who didn't read our stories, or maybe they're coming into this for the first time, you know, we have this one-time multi-million dollar opportunity to address this crisis with these national settlement funds. So Dr. Pollan, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what funds are coming to Michigan over the next several years, and how is that divided up among the state and the local governments? 
Sure. The um, so the Michigan is slated to potentially receive about one point five billion dollars over the next um, over the next sixteen years. It's we're two years into eighteen years. Um, this is through a, a series of litigation that forty six states uh, decided to participate in, with Michigan's Attorney General um, Office being one of those states. Um, and so it is. It was litigation against the manufacturers, developers, and distributors of opioids uh, and their contribution to the current. Uh, so opioid use disorder uh, and, and um, addiction and mental health crisis here in the here in Michigan. Uh, Michigan is receiving um, a disproportionately high amount because we have been disproportionately highly impacted, which means that more of our citizens are dying than in, in, in many of our neighboring states. So if you look at the Great Lakes region, um, most of our neighboring states are receiving um, about a third of what, um, a third to half of what Michigan is receiving. The money that comes in through those settlements uh, goes into an opioid healing and recovery fund. 50% of that money is distributed directly to local counties, municipalities, and townships. And 50% of that money is put into a fund that is um, administered by uh, Michigan's legislature. Uh, to date, over the last two years, that money, uh, the legislature has appropriated money directly uh, to the Department of Health and Human Services. The carve out from that is that any settlements that go through the bankruptcy courts uh, go directly to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So in short, we're getting more money, but it's because of basically more horrible realities here in Michigan over the last year, few years. So given that 50-50 split in funding, 50% to the state or flows through the state, 50% going to the state or through local governments, let's start with the state side of things. How did the state of Michigan decide on its priorities for its settlement fund so far? And what are some of the biggest expenditures? And if you could start this by talking about your role or the role of the Opioid Advisory Commission in all of this. So the Opioid uh, Advisory Commission was um, is a was established by the legislature. Um, and so that is the body that is legally bound through um, a public act. So it's in law that we exist um, to advise the legislature on the appropriation of that funding. Um, and then that and then that is and then the legislature appropriates or sends that funding um, out um, a court out according to how they would like to do that. Um, in the first year of the appropriation Creations, the OAC actually didn't exist. Um, so legislature kind of uh, wrote sort of, I refer to it as almost like a blank check to DHHS in terms of this funding. Um, and the OAC is responsible for reporting back to the legislature on those expenditures, as well as um, providing, ed, 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 serving in an advisory capacity for the legislature, um, as well as uh, make, ensuring that there is uh, some sort of kind of check and balance on how this funding is being used. Um, one of the struggles we've had is that uh, we haven't been able to receive as much information from the department about how they're using um, the money. So it's unclear to um, the Opioid Advisory Commission how the state of Michigan decided to prioritize its share of the settlement funds. Um, that would be a question that the department would have to answer. And when we've asked that question, um, there is now a website uh, for the opioid settlement dollars uh, on Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website that um, talks a little bit about how they're using that funding. I will note that um, some of those catchment areas have changed. For instance, um, there was a line item for $1.4 million to go to recovery community organizations that has been um, reduced to to about uh to about four hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars and and we don't we don't have any communication from the department or any transparency publicly in terms of why or how that change was was made um, there is an opportunity for um, at every commission meeting uh, we do have space for public for public members to speak we also have um, are doing listening sessions across the state um, both virtually and in person to try to reach the most um, citizens as possible and on our website further um, it is a survey that folks can do to help inform um, what those priorities should be and we will be and we will be elevating those to the legislature notably um Hopefully by the end of this week, um, our annual report should be posted on the Opioid Advisory Commission um, website, which uh, which can which is public public facing and publicly available. 
Great. So that answered one of the reader's questions already about how to be involved. So there's public public time at the, the OAC meetings. Um, and I, I do want to clarify or add a couple of things. Okay. Um, we did ask the state health department to be involved with this as, as well. They didn't have anybody. They told us they didn't have anybody available uh, at this point to be here today. Um, but we have made that 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 request as well. Um, and I believe, Amber, you've dropped into the chat um, a, a link to the state's opioid settlement page. Um, if you go there, you will find a ton of information on how the state kind of the, their their priorities so far. It's a lot of information. You have to wade through it. You have to take some time to get used to it. Um, but there is quite a bit of information at that page for readers who want to know more. And well, then well, I thank you, Dr. Pro yeah, thank you, Dr. Poland. I really appreciate uh, you, you all being here. Um, um, you, you talked about the 50% going to the state. Let's let, let's uh, turn our attention to the other 50%. That's that's going to local municipalities, you know, counties mainly, but some cities, some townships. Um, Amy, if we can go to you for a second here. Um, now, Amy, you work with the Michigan Association of Counties, and you've been working very, you know, hand in hand with counties trying to figure out, you know, how how to approach these funds that are coming in. Um, our reporting found that there's not a single process that is being used for, for making those spending decisions. Can you talk a little bit about how counties are approaching how to spend this money wisely and, and how there might be differences depending on the, the community as to how that's, that process is going? Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. So with most counties, what we're seeing is that there are, are really no two counties doing this the same way. Um, everyone is taking a bit of a different approach. Uh, at the Michigan Association of Counties, we did provide uh, a guidance document, a toolkit um, that was released the same day that uh, county governments did receive their first dollars uh, back in January of 2023 to really help folks um, to understand or try to look at working through a, a specific process that's really focused on stakeholder engagement, data collection and understanding local needs, as well as understanding current capacity at the county level, and then thinking through accountability and monitoring. Um, what we know is that capacity differs from county to county, existing infrastructure differs from county to county, um, I think some great examples are many communities have had either prevention coalitions or uh, an opioid related task force that's been in existence for a while and focused on these issues where those stakeholders were already at the table uh, and many communities throughout the state didn't have that existing infrastructure to work with. Thank you. And and you may have you've answered this partially here, but I want to uh, broach it again. Um, uh, Readers or providers of of, of services um, sometimes look at this and and say, "Gosh, some counties have already spent some of this money, dispersed it, and some haven't spent a cent yet." Can you talk a little bit about why that might be and why it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing either way? Yeah, there's really two parts to this entire discussion. Um, there's the urgency of addressing the drug overdose crisis and the reason that we are receiving these dollars, the, the profound impacts uh, across the state and, and within our communities. And then there's also the desire to be intentional about how these dollars are used to really support communities the best way possible, save the most lives, and really think through long-term sustainable solutions to addressing the crisis as a whole, as opposed to just um, funding things that might address an immediate or acute need. So what we see is that for those folks, for those communities that have had greater capacity, um, they typically have been able to move that process along a bit quicker and maybe get funds out the door um, more easily than other communities. But what we see across the state is a real commitment to transparency. We see a real commitment to ensuring that these funds um, are directed towards those most profoundly impacted by the crisis. Well, there's a lot of discretion um, that is allowed at the, at the local level. There are some guardrails, right, Amy? And so I was, can, can you talk just briefly uh, for our uh, readers here today, what are those guardrails? So we do have a few documents that guide 
um, all spending related to these settlements. So most of the settlements, not all, have really two key components, legal components that folks have to uh, really abide by. One of those is Exhibit E, which is a list of allowable uses, specifically allowable uses that are evidence-based or promising practices, and then we also have the definition of opioid remediation. And so at each local government, their own uh, attorneys, corporate counsel have the ability um, to interpret those and then be able to say this expenditure is allowable in our community. What we do also know is that the attorney general's office here in Michigan is responsible for enforcement. And so that means if a county does not spend in alignment with Exhibit E or the definition of opioid remediation, the AG's office here in Michigan would step in um, to carry out whatever their enforcement process may be. Um, when you talk about how these counties um, are approaching this, um, and obviously they're trying to like build this airplane while it's flying here since the money's already, some of the money's already in their accounts. Um, what is your understanding from from talking uh, to the uh, county officials as to who is at the tables when they're making these decisions and and whether whether uh, you or uh, uh, Mac is is providing some suggestions as to who should be at the table when these decisions are being made? Yes, so Mac has provided guidance um, from the release of our toolkit all the way through now, uh, where we really focus on both stakeholder engagement and partnership with other governments. Um, so governments working with townships, with cities, with tribal nations, um, being able to potentially coordinate some of those efforts, or at least keep folks in the loop on on where those activities may align um, with other individuals in the same region per se. Now, we have really focused on, uh, especially lately, Mac just hosted a webinar on how to meaningfully engage with individuals with lived experience. Uh, that has been a group that we have very much asked for all folks to have at the table, highlighted the importance uh, of their participation, um, not just in in planning efforts, but really in decision making as well and where that's possible. Um, so we have also looked at providers, so treatment providers, harm reduction providers, prevention providers, recovery support services, healthcare, schools, businesses, faith-based communities, uh, really an endless list of different sectors of our community that can be involved in this process and each bring a unique perspective to the table. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about um, how this is being approached at the state level and how the local communities are doing it. I'd love to turn to Dr. Stoltman now and talk a little bit. Uh, I, you know, Dr. Stoltman is based here in Michigan, but he has a bit of a national pr perspective on this issue um, through the um, through the Opioid Policy Institute. Um, Dr. Stoltman, I know you see the larger national picture here, and I was wondering if you could talk for uh, a few minutes here about how Michigan compares to other states, both in how it spends the money and the opioid settlement funds that are available and the reports that are uh, about how the money is being spent. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And thank you, Robin, for having us on today. Uh, it's a really important topic, so we're really excited that Bridge is covering it. And it's a great question, Ron. So how Michigan is doing compared to other states is not super great uh, when it comes to transparency. And so what I mean by that is there are a number of different states, about 19 of them, that have committed to, at a state level, reporting how all of their money is being spent. Michigan is coming along in that way. I was just on the website this morning just to make sure that I wasn't uh, <laughs> inaccurate with the most up-to-date information that's out there. So they do have information about 2023 year in Michigan and 2024. Uh, but with that, with 2024, it's not really clear who received that money and how they selected who would receive that money. So when we talk about transparency, those are two really important parts of the process is how do people actually apply for these funds? And you can see that in the chat. Uh, there's a lot of people trying to figure out, well, I know that there's money in my community. I know it's in my county. I know the state has some money, but like, how do I make sure that that's going to the things that we know work? And so when we look at the 2023 numbers, uh, there is actually some information, but you can only find it, or I was only able to find it easily from Christine Minhe's opioidsettlementtracker.com. They're the national leader in tracking how all of the states are, are doing this opioid settlement stuff. They're a, a lawyer, they're in Washington, they're just a wonderful person and a wonderful resource for this area. And so I'm always trying to see, you know, how are we comparing to those other states? And 
like I said, not super great. Um, and then as Amy said, the other wrinkle is, so the state gets 50% of the money in Michigan, but the counties get the other 50%. And so making sure that that other 50% also has those same processes and transparency. And that's where we'd like to see the state be a little bit more involved in providing some guidance for how to do that, how to, how to run those grants and how to provide that information transparently to all of our stakeholders. Thank you. Um, uh, let me let me throw like a big softball right across the middle of the home plate for you here, uh, so you can slam it out a, a, a home run with it here. But tell me why why that sort of transparency is important. Why, why does it matter that that maybe Michigan is a little behind the curve on letting the public know exactly how this money is being spent? Yeah, thanks, Ron. I'll see if I can I'll see if I can hit it out. So I think the OAC has done a great job of putting that pressure on increasing transparency. Community members have been putting pressure on increasing transparency. So we do see some progress in that way from the OAC. But why it's really important is I think taking a step back and Kara talked a little bit about this is why do we have that money in Michigan and why is there over a billion dollars coming to Michigan? It's because we've been massively impacted by the opioid crisis. And so that's hitting family members, that's hitting our communities, that's hitting law enforcement, that's hitting providers who are you know, overstretched in their ability to provide mental health and addiction treatment services. And so we wanna make sure because of the crisis being so acute that the money is then spent to actually address those things. And so we think it's really important at the Opioid Policy Institute that like Amy said, all of those stakeholders are at the table, they're both aware of what's happening with the money, they're aware of how to inform how the money is being spent um, and so that means open calls for grants, um, just something as simple as, hey, here's a priority area for us. Uh, task force has developed that priority area. And now anybody in the community can apply for those grants and make sure that it's being spent in a way that actually affects the crisis. And what I mean by that, of course, is making sure we're doing things that are based on the evidence. And so in addiction in particular, we know from decades of research, the things that work and that can really help move the needle on some of these issues. And so we need to make sure that, you know, that both the counties, municipalities, uh, cities, and state, if they're creating spending priorities that they're actually aligned with and spending it in a way that is going to actually make an impact. And so you can only tell that if you can see how the money is being spent, where the priority areas are, and then we can go back and say what was working and what wasn't with evaluation. So I think that's I don't that's probably too long of an answer in terms of a home run, Ron. But <laughs> I think that's uh, <laughs> I think that's what we're looking for with transparency and why it's really really important. And I go back to, again, uh, because family members have been so impacted, and those family members were part of the lawsuits in many cases um, and asked to testify. And so when they're demanding accountability, when they're demanding transparency, it's because this money was won with their family's blood. And so we really owe it to them to make sure that it's done in a way that is responsive to that. I think you just hit a grand slam there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, can can you, for, for readers, uh, give just sort of summary as to if, if there is a simple answer, I'm not sure there is, but why some states have more reporting and some states have less? I mean, it, it, is, it's, it wasn't set up nationally where it'd all be the same? Well, why is it different? Yeah, this actually might be a really good question for Amy, but I'll try to answer it, Ron. So my understanding is, you know, each of the states had their own sub agreements uh, and that was done with the counties and states. And so what I mean by that is like the state's attorney general who is leading the trial for like representing the state is then negotiating with the counties and cities for how to do it. And so in terms of transparency, some of the states said, hey, there's going to be some transparency requirements, there are legal requirements that we're setting up. I can't tell you why the state of Michigan decided not to do that, uh, but I know many states did. <laughs> and so there's already kind of um, a nice framework if the state of Michigan were to try to increase some of that transparency and accountability. We have model laws that are available. We have other states that are actually practically doing those things that we know that they should be. So it should be a pretty easy thing for them to try to adjust that and then move forward to have that increased accountability and transparency. I can't really tell you the decision-making process prior to that, uh, but it is very confusing for people in the field that those things weren't set up from the get-go. And it was one of those things that, uh, you know, as I'm on these calls and talking to folks, it was really clear that not having those legal requirements in there was gonna lead to these issues. And so we're, I, this is kind of a slow moving avalanche of problems, unfortunately, but we do have an ability to like stop it. So I don't know, Amy, I don't know if you wanted to add to that a little bit. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. So the the 
Attorney General's Office here in Michigan um, did have to negotiate uh, those settlement agreements, the state subdivision agreement specifically, um, with the attorneys or counsel um, or a group of attorneys representing the local governments here in Michigan. So um, I was not at all a part of those discussions and, and uncertain of how that process went. But what I can say is that the Michigan Association of Counties um, is planning to uh, roll out an annual voluntary reporting survey to all of the counties specifically. Uh, and that should be taking place uh, just a little later this spring. That's Thank a great you. question. Uh, yeah, one last question for you, Dr. Stoltman, and uh, it may be a question if we have time, we'll, we'll ask the other panelists because it's a really good one. Uh, we're at the, the, this money's being, being uh, uh, distributed to states you know, and, and local communities around the nation over an 18 year period. We're, we're just at the beginning of this, this, that what we're seeing here. Uh, any lessons that, 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 that you would, um, that, that we should be learning from what we've seen over the first, uh, first, uh, or couple of rounds of, uh, checks coming into people's bank accounts. Yeah, it's a great question, Ron. And one of the things as the researcher uh, that I try to think about is evaluation. And so at least as far as I know, I haven't seen any evaluation reports from the state. I know that money was set aside to do evaluation to understand how the money is having an impact in the community. But that's the type of thing that like I'm keeping a really sharp eye on is trying to understand is there evaluation as part of these grants to make sure that they are having an impact going forward. Because we know that, like I said, there's those evidence-based approaches, whether it's harm reduction, syringe service programs, whether it's naloxone distribution uh, to reverse overdose deaths, whether it's medications for opioid use disorder like buprenorphine and methadone, we know that those types of things are, are highly effective. And so we want to make sure if we're giving money to folks that are doing that, is it having the impact that we'd like to see? So I think in terms of like lessons, the biggest lesson, because we don't know how the money is being spent, is transparency. Uh, so it's really hard to evaluate those things as an outside person if I can't see like who got the money and what they're doing with that. So it's a it's a hard question to ask or to, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, but I do think that, again, we know things that work, uh, which is really exciting as a scientist. And we know that there's evaluation that we can do. Uh, so we just got to make sure that we're doing that. And and I was encouraged to see that at least the state of Michigan has evaluation components in their statewide grants. I'm not sure that the counties are doing that or if they have the capacity to do that sort of work um, because there is, you know, that's that's a pretty nuanced area. But I do think that that's a great area where the state could be doing things to try to help out the counties to evaluate, are the grants having an impact that we'd like to see? I don't know if anybody else had anything to add to that. I think you covered it nicely. <laughs> well then, you know what, let's build on that. Um, you know, we we now have a little bit of background about how this was set up in Michigan, how our set our spending decisions were set up in Michigan. And, you know, from what Dr. Stoltman said, you know, we we know that we should be looking at the evidence to get the biggest bang for our buck. So I'm wondering, you know, how do we move forward? And Dr. Poland, I'll ask you this, and and I'll ask because of this. You know, since we did our first stories, we've been hearing from providers who say they can't figure out how to tap into this money. They don't know who to call. We've been hearing from families who've lost loved ones saying, I want to have a voice. So, and then you spoke today at this legislative hearing just this morning about concerns, and you've mentioned it, there, this, this frustration working with the state. So I guess the question here is, how should we make decisions going forward? So the um, Opioid Advisory Commission has their next annual report where it's slated to be to be um, made public at the end of this week. So that will be available on the Opioid Advisory Commission website. And it does contain some direct recommendations to legislature for more community involvement, increased transparency, increased oversight. I do want to be very clear that the money currently in the lack of transparencies is coming from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the OAC has committed to transparency. All of our meetings are available via Zoom. Um, our staff person is available for one-on-one -on -one conversations with impacted individuals. We are working diligently with the legislature to hopefully put some additional parameters around uh, the appropriation of the funding uh, to ensure sure that there are more transparent processes required by the department and to really, um, at least at first, maybe force some more collaboration and information sharing across this legislative body, as well as the executive.
executive, um, as well as the executive branch where Department of Health uh, sits. Um, the Department of Health also has an opioid task force, uh, which was created by executive order by uh, Governor Whitmer and then expanded last fall. Uh, originally, it included mostly, it included all government departments for collaboration across the government. And as of about a year ago, they, uh, sorry, September of 2022, so, uh, so a little, or a little bit more than that, um, they were expanded to include uh, representation from one of our 10 uh, PIHP, our mental health regions uh, in, in the state of Michigan, a member from each of those regions. Um, and and uh, that group also had a racial equity work group um, that we don't know exactly what happened. The OAC was not informed of the decision to eliminate that um, to seemingly eliminate that group. I know you did some reporting on that as well, Robin. So there is an article that people can get some more information of that. Um, in response to that, the OAC has uh, put into their recommendations that there be a focus on um, marginalized populations, whether that's um, geographically, uh, there was a comment from somebody up in Traverse City, so in some of our more rural communities, whether that is uh, gender uh, discrepancies, we know that um, mothers in particular find it harder to find an access treatment, um, We um, whether that's, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, uh, there's also recommendations around uh, tribal populations that have been disproportionately impacted. Again, and we have the listening series in order to make sure that the voices of Michiganders are heard so people can join that. They can do our survey, which is available on our website, um, or they can uh, email our um, OAC at legislature.mi.gov. It's on the website um, to, uh, to have a one on one conversation so you can have some privacy if, if kind of a, if you would like a conversation um, and don't want to do that in in some of these listening sessions as well. So there, there are ways to get involved. Absolutely. You know, and I, just, just a quick reminder or to anybody who joined late, again, remember the money to the state is split 50-50. Part of this goes to the state, part of this goes to the local government. It's governments, and it is easy to get those two things confused. So thank you for making that clarification again. Um, you know, we also heard from readers, Dr. Poland, um, or, or I guess any, any of our panelists here, these were readers who said, you know, we, 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 we've got these policies to rein in opioid addiction, but that's made it difficult for people who are in serious pain to actually get the prescriptions they need. So we're pulling away from the settlement monies for a minute, I guess. But, you know, how do we make these policies so that we're we're trying to tackle, you know, opioid addiction while also accommodating people in real need? Absolutely, that that has been that has been a big struggle um, nationwide in the healthcare systems. We sort of the pendulum kind of swung to this very opioid liberal prescribing, and now it's swung to these very opioid restrictive prescribing, and that has unfortunately left individuals um, who have chronic pain at risk. Um, individual hospital policies. I know Michigan Hospital Association has some supports for both patients as well as um, hospitals and providers who are providing some uh, some of this pain medicine care. Um, you know, there there's a lot of reform that needs to happen to ensure that people have um, adequate access. Just like we're asking for an addiction for evidence based safe practices, as Dr. Stoltman referred to, um, ensuring that we are using the evidence to treat people with chronic pain and that they don't fall through the gra gaps. You know, 10 or so years ago, we used to be before fentanyl was uh, such a driver in the overdose crisis. Um, at one point, it was over 80% of people who that who used heroin or fentanyl um, illicitly had started with prescription opioids. Um, and so while we've seen that number go down because we have restricted that opi those opioid prescriptions on new initiations, we have to really be mindful of what's happening to our patients with chronic pain. Yeah, tough balancing act. And it is it is a balancing act, but some of you know so, so the opioid remediation do dollars can also be used for things like prevention, and so some of that some of that conversation around what happens when somebody gets that first initial prescription for opioids? How can we minimize that risk to that adolescent um, who, you know, has their wisdom teeth removed? Do they do they need a prescription for Norco, or do we, you know, can we lean on, you know, what we call alto alternatives to opioids, um, things that are that have 
maybe a little bit less uh, less risk to them. Things like Motrin, Tylenol. You know, in the case of in the case of wisdom tooth extractions, can we do kind of saltwater gargles and local anesthetics rather than you know ra rather than kind of pulling out this very strong potent medication that has additional risks to the ado adolescent brain? Um, so certainly, uh, you know, certainly there the uh, there is a kind of a list, it's called Exhibit E from the settlement dollars that kind of gives some of those parameters, but prevention is definitely one of those buckets. And that is someplace where we can put some focus on to um, chronic pain, as well as kind of just preventing substance use in general. I've said it several times this last few months as we've been doing these this reporting that both my kids had their wisdom teeth pulled in the last few years and both kids, their first prescription was for an opioid. It didn't get filled, but without asking me, that's what they uh, my two minor kids were prescribed. We're almost at the point we're going to turn, we've got some reader questions to take, but I do want to ask this and I think Ron's got a question too. You know, Moving away from opioids just a little bit, um, we did a recent, uh, or there was a national study recently that noted the increase in meth and cocaine, methamphetamines and cocaine in recent years. And that's something that state health officials have noted too. I'm just wondering, does can can national settle, the opioid settlement funds somehow, you know, uh, uh, work to address this kind of crisis, a crisis of another drug? And I don't know which of the panelists might be best to to address that. Maybe Jonathan. Oh, Kara was gonna. Or Dr. Fulham was gonna say something. Sorry. Oh, great. Go Perfect. Ahead. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Um, so the opioid settlement dollar as well, it says opioid settlement can be used for the addiction and mental health crisis. So it is not limited to only opioids. Um, and we definitely have seen um, a lot of communities and a lot of engagement around other substance use. Um, and and uh, in our report, we in the OAC report, we talk about also the um, suicide crisis that is that has struck our state as well. And I would just add, Dr. Poland, uh, when we think about drug use, it, it's often talked about in like individual substances, but it's been a poly substance crisis for decades, which just means multiple substances. And so in my time in West Virginia, it was never really just about opioids. It was always opioids and stimulants. And those things come in waves, of course, um, as they move through the community. But of course, the opioid settlement money is structured in a way that can respond to that because it is something that's over now 16 years. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're not just focusing on the last problem, but we're able to respond really um, nimbly to those future problems and the threats that we're seeing right now. Yeah, I have a question that that's, I think, uh, very related to this in a way. It's about, about how money can be spent. Um, Robin and I have all um, over, over the past few weeks have been hearing a lot about um, from people in the community who are either um, in recovery looking to get in recovery or providers who talk about some of the roadblocks that exist um, for treatment um, that uh, go beyond what you would normally think of as like education, treatment, recovery, but go go to like holistically life. Okay. You know, housing, transportation, uh, employment, um, things like that, that, that may not spe specifically be covered within the bounds of what this, how this money is supposed to be spent. But sometimes these larger issues, you know, affect, you know, substance abuse. Um, Amy, um, can any of the, can these funds be used? How, how broadly can these funds be used? Is what I'm trying to say. If, if, if one of the issues is we have no, no way for, uh, someone to get to treatment because they don't have a car, they don't have transportation. Can it be used for cabs? Can it be used for gas? I don't know. I'm just, does how, how broadly can it be used to help these issues that, that, that on the, on service level, you may not think are related to uh, substance use. Yeah. The opioid settlement funds can absolutely be used to address many of those, those issues. When we talk about looking at, you know, the drivers of health, we look at transportation, education, child care, these are also just part of really the, the wraparound services or creating recovery ready communities uh, and creating opportunities for folks to not just have um, treatment be the only option where the acute crisis is addressed, 
but really creating a system uh, that supports an individual on a lifelong journey. And so we, we do see some funds being used in those space. Of course, at the end of the day, folks really have to be running those ideas by, um, by the attorneys that are a part of that government. Um, but we, we do see a lot of folks looking to address uh, broader issues and help support connections to care. Thank you. We do know that there was some funding that went to transportation from the department. There was an RFP that came out, um, but I, I, I don't have additional details. Let's jump to some reader questions, including one that's kind of along these lines. Um, one of the readers wants to know, can counties direct funds to law enforcement? Um, let's talk a little bit about, and we understand that a lot of counties haven't made those decisions yet. They're in the middle of them. Um, but let's talk about kind of the philosophies or, you know, how, how counties may angle their funds. And I'm guessing, Amy, that's probably a question for you. Yeah, so when we look specifically at Exhibit E, uh, and when they look at law enforcement, we really see two primary roles of these funds related to law enforcement. The first of which is supporting uh, response to overdose. So the, the process, procedure, what it takes to get and to, and to respond to that individual. So training um, in that component. The other would be to address the secondary trauma associated with responding to overdose. So supporting first responders and the impact that responding to this crisis uh, has on them. Those would be the two um, really explicitly outlined ways to focus dollars um, towards law enforcement. Um, yeah, and I'll just add to that, Amy, uh, you know, it's important that law enforcement, because, you know, drug use is illegal, that they are a part of these discussions, but they don't dominate these discussions, because we know that, for example, prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery, that's the full range of available ways to spend the money. And so we don't want to see a bunch of it go towards any one of those things, because there are so many gaps across all of those when we think about the state of Michigan. And it goes probably something that you told me a while ago, Jonathan, which is, or Dr. Stoltman, it is, it is the idea that whoever's at the table, it's those voices that probably will get, you know, that, that have this, they're the ones with the strongest voice in getting the money toward their, you know, their efforts. Exactly. And so that's why, to Amy's point prior, we want people with lived experience to be on those, those panels and those discussions, both informing the planning process and then being able to apply for the, for the grants when they come out. We want treatment providers like Dr. Poland to be part of that discussion process because we want to make sure that it's not just the county sheriff that's helping decide how the money's spent, because then it's really predictable how the money's going to be spent. And not that that's um, that's just that's a huge problem when we think about the gaps being so substantial across all of our communities in Michigan. You know, I'm going to I'm going to add to that, and and another reader asked this too um, when we're talking about those voices at the table. And Dr. Poland, you mentioned this earlier, the racial equity group work group was disbanded. Um, tease that out a little bit for me. I mean, what do we know about that and why is that a concern for you? Um, really, really quick. I just do want to add that every single one of my fellow commissioners and myself have either personal lived experience or a family member um, who has been impacted by the substance use and mental health crisis. Um, personally, my mother, my brother, and my sister-in-law all have died in the past. And very recently, like a week ago today, my aunt died of alcohol and opioid related causes. So we are volunteering our time at the state, but we are also have been deeply and personally impacted by this crisis. In fact, since our last report came out, myself and two other commissioners, um, one lost, one's brother died and one's um, son died. Uh, so this is deeply personal to all of my commissioners. In terms of the racial equity work group, um, we don't really know why uh, DHHS decided decided that they were no longer going to convene this group, at least at this time. Um, I don't have any further information. Um, what I can say is that the Opioid Advisory Commission um, is, is hopeful that we will be able to continue to hear from the disproportionately impacted and be able to take, uh, you know, we know that we know that we have a huge divergence in terms of the impact on 
um, on, on different races in our communities. And we're seeing a strong increase in opioid overdoses in our black population, and that's simply not acceptable. Um, and so we need to be diverting funds and resources to reduce that disparity. The other population that the OAC has been working with is our tribal sovereign nations. Um, and the, the, the difficulty with the data is um, is that it's there's just not a lot of people. The population is small is one difficulty. And then because um, of the way our the way our, our um, like our statistics work, sometimes um, people from indigenous populations end up in another category, um, particularly if they are multiracial and it goes into that. Um, the other thing to note for our tribal sovereign nations is that they are sovereign nations. So it's not um, not just a race and ethnicity conversation with them, but we are talking about government to government conversations between the Michigan, the state of Michigan government and the 12 sovereign nations. Um, so we're looking at the OAC has recommendations to provide um, direct funding to uh, the to the 12 recognized tribes in the state of Michigan. There is precedent for this. There will be a supplement to the OAC report. I just wish it had come out a couple of days earlier earlier instead of a couple of days after this um, that speaks specifically to those recommendations and again to encouraging um, encouraging not only that we get lived experience conversations um, improved racial equity into into our conversation look I'm the first to say that when I look around the commission while we are all deeply impacted uh, we are not racially diverse so that's part of why this has been a huge push for the OAC is to make sure that that we we don't lose that voice um, and just at, starting at our last meeting we meet monthly um, the uh, chairman uh, Jamie stuck uh, from the uh, here and band of the Potawatomis as well as the president of United Tribes so the tribe so United Tribes of Michigan um, is now a commissioner so we're very fortunate to have that voice and we'll be continuing to work towards a better representation amongst our commissioners um, as things move forward. I have a question that that uh, I think I'm wrapping up probably a dozen uh, questions that are um, in our feed and that Robin and I have received and and Amy probably you have received too. Um, so I'm I'm going to address it to you. Uh, a lot of people saying, "How can I get involved? How can my voice be heard? I want to make sure you know I've I've got some expertise in yet in in something, or I want to make sure that my lived experience they understand." Um, obviously, every county is doing things differently. Um, but as a starting point, who would you suggest that in generically, what, you know, um, where would you contact first to try to find out who to talk to, to either be involved in some way or at least submit something uh, to the people who are making the decisions? We are seeing an increase in the number of public facing county websites that really do address opioid settlements. And in most of those cases, meeting minutes will be available. Information about the planning process, how to get involved um, will be on a website. So I would absolutely start with county websites. Um, county commission meetings, obviously another place to go. Um, we do know that you know at the end of the day, uh, that is the group that will make these funding decisions, um, but may not be at all involved in the planning process. The planning process looks different for every county. So sometimes we see the health department leading those efforts, sometimes county administration, sometimes county commissioners, um, sometimes community corrections. We, we really see a wide variety, uh, but I do think that, you know, starting with the commissioners, uh, most will have an understanding of where things are at, or at least who to get in touch with. Um, folks can also reach out to me directly if they do have interest in finding out more about a specific community, specific dollar amounts, um, or can visit our, our website uh, that has a, a dashboard that outlines some additional information about specific dollars um, related to each county. Amy, that's such a great answer. I, the other, the only thing I would add, Amy, is like persistence, uh, because it is really hard sometimes to kind of crack the walls of government. But it's important to have those voices included, especially like Amy said before, people with lived experience, 
And so we want to make sure that, you know, you use those resources that are available on the OAC's website and the Michigan Association of Counties website to try to navigate that process. And I say persistence. I love East Grand Rapids, which is where I live. Uh, but and we're only getting I think the city of East Grand Rapids is getting like eight thousand dollars last year. It's like nothing. <laughs> but I can't figure out how they're spending it. Uh, and I've reached out to a few folks and I will continue to do so because I think it's important that even even every even something as small as eight thousand dollars could be spent in a way that like really has an impact on our community. So just kind of keep it up. Um, and I know that that's asking a lot of our community members to do that. But your voices are important. And so I want to make sure that you you know that that's valuable and and just keep trying. That's really worrisome that you and your position can't get the information, can't sort through the. Uh... The labyrinth of government to figure that out. This this question came from one of the readers, and it came up in the the hearing earlier today. Um, we were talking, you know, some of the lawmakers were talking about all the different counties spending, and you know, being at different points in their spending. And one of the lawmakers actually said it felt like it was bordering on the absurd that you had all these different counties and all these different governments spending money differently. Um, one of the readers says, you know, it'll, it, it seems like allowing county by county requests and use of the funding does, it doesn't feel efficient. So they're wondering, and this question again came up this morning, is there a way to kind of combine funding or to have more of a regional approach? Is there a way to regionalize this funding to gain critical mass in a solution? There absolutely is the ability to, to combine funds, whether that's township, city, and county all in one space, whether that's across counties, whether that's regionally. Um, I, I'm not sure. We, we do have some counties that very much are interested in this level of collaboration, but I think because so many counties are at a different point in the process, um, reaching that alignment may take a little bit longer. Um, so I think that that is something that there are there are folks really looking into and, and hoping to see um, related to their their issues. The way that because these funds go directly to the local governments, it really is important to recognize that um, local communities tend to really understand solutions that work for their populations, as well as an understanding that many of these uh, communities were actually litigating against these. Uh, entities, corporations on their own. And so this almost is as if everyone really submitted those um, those lawsuits kind of on their own. Now, I'm not an attorney, so I know this isn't exactly how it should be stated, uh, but it really is as if they each had individually done this as they're receiving a, that direct distribution of funds. And to Amy's point too, uh, the Michigan Association of Counties provides a lot of support for the counties. Uh, and and having the money at the county level, I think, is important or at, at the city level. But I do worry, and I've uh, talked with folks about this before, do they have the expertise to spend the money well? And are they up to date on what the evidence and science would suggest? And so that's where you'd like to see the state kind of weigh in a little bit more. Um, that's where you'd like to see the counties leverage the Michigan Association of Counties and the experts that they have there or the Opioid Advisory Committee so they can get pointed in that right direction. Um, because as much as I love that it's like 50% going to the counties, I, it also scares that swear word out of me uh, because you don't really know what they're going to do um, because they just don't have the level of expertise that you would see in different counties, right? Like the Wayne counties, Kent County, where I am, the Oakland counties, um, some of those bigger counties have a lot of folks that have been doing this for a long time. Where I worry is where some of the smaller rural counties that are also getting a bucket of cash, do they know all of these evidence-based approaches that we know can be effective? And so we just got to make sure that we're helping them out. And that's why I love the technical assistance that Michigan Association of Counties offers and Dr. Poland does through Michigan State University. I don't, I don't know actually what it technically is. It's Michigan State and a bunch of other people. Okay, thank you. We are running very short of time and boy, we could go on for hours on this topic and, and, and not run out of questions and very good answers from our panelists. I want to wrap this up uh, before we turn it over to Jackie with just a lightning round, very quick 30 second answers from each of you. How optimistic or pessimistic are you right now about how Michigan's doing fighting uh, opioid substance abuse? Uh, I'm going to start with our Dr. Poland. Well, I think that what the data shows is that we can do better. And the way to do better is to have collaboration across the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, the OAC, um, the state and local shares. We need to be working together to impact this crisis. Um, and the only way we can do that is if we 
all approach this as equal partners. And I look forward to hopefully uh, the legislature taking a more active role um, in terms of supporting the Opioid Advisory Commission and those conversations with the department. Thank you, Amy. I'm very optimistic on the county side. Over the last couple months, we've seen a drastic increase in the amount of technical assistance requests coming in, uh, the amount of questions that are being asked, and the desire for more information in a lot of areas, um, which I think is is really telling about the, the direction we're headed, at least from the local perspective. Dr. Stoltman, take us home. Sure, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, 16 years is a long time, <laughs> and so there's a lot that can go wrong in those 16 years. But I do know we we know the tools. Uh, we have the tools available. We need to, to your question earlier, Ron, we need to make sure those are accessible. Um, and so we need grants that are out there that increase access to those services, but we know what works. Um, so now that we have this money, we can really make that impact. But I, I say again, the only way we can make sure we're having that impact is with transparency and accountability. Because if we don't have that, then I am I have zero. <laughs> I have zero chance that we're going to do a really good job of that. But right now, I remain cautiously optimistic because we're moving in the right direction. All right. Well, thank you all. And and um, th these questions, I think that probably Rob and I will be <laughs> may be following. Might have a lot of stories we can do just from uh, the comments we're getting here. Uh, but thank you all so much. Um, and uh, Jackie, we'll we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ron. Um, thank you to Amy, uh, Dr. Pollan, Dr. Stoltman, Rob and Ron. Thank you to everyone here, including um, everybody who showed up during their lunch break to hang out with us. Um, we'll be posting a recording of today's program on Bridge Michigan's website, app, and social media channels this week, and our March event will be announced very soon. Um, for help with opioid abuse, Call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services National Hotline, a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year treatment referral hotline that can be reached at 1-800-662-HELP. Um, thank you again, and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone.